Hi everyone, I am Maria. Welcome to CME, my channel. A friend of mine suggested that I should react to Finding Nemo and explain some things during the movie, and I thought this was a great idea. I have watched Finding Nemo a couple of times, but I have not watched it for many, many years. I am really looking forward to see it again because it's been a while. I'm looking forward to share whatever I can with you, and let's start. As you can see by the remote, it's a uh, new technology. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna stop right there. Actually, clownfish are very interesting because they usually live in groups and there is only one female in each group and she is the highest in the hierarchy. So she is usually the biggest and the most important fish. And she only mates with one male who is the second in the hierarchy, normally bigger than all the other males, which are considered juveniles. I'm sorry for noises of this. This makes noises. Okay. Something which is very interesting as well is that clownfish are sequential hermaphrodites, which means they change sex throughout their lives. All clownfish are born male. So once the, so the biggest and most important and also the female dies, the next male, so the one that was reproducing with the female before, becomes the female. And the next older male, or the oldest of the juveniles, becomes the next male which is reproducing with the new female. So if this were biologically correct, then they would be the main couple in the group. Even though they do not live in the group, but I mean, they also talk, so... That's a nuance that I am ready to accept. Let's keep on going. Coral reefs, beautiful. All male. Also, um, two things about clownfish, which are, I think, interesting to know. They are very territorial fish, so they actually put their eggs close to where they can always keep an eye on them. So this is accurate here on the movie. And they are pretty territorial, so they, if they, if, I, I, my essay, essay back at university when I was studying clownfish was about their behavior towards fish that were passing by their eggs and to see how aggressive they would be. And they were pretty aggressive to fish, even bigger than them, that would pass by their eggs. And they would kind of charge against them. Another thing is, uh, regarding the anemone, the clownfish do live in a, a symbiosis with anemones. Anemones usually sting, and other fish will try to avoid them to avoid the sting. And the clownfish actually have developed somehow a way to coexist with these animals. They live together with the anemones, they kind of live in their tentacles. And the, on the one hand, the anemone provides protection against the other fish that do not want to be stung. And the clownfish, on the other hand, probably provides some kind of also protection and also some kind of nutritious advantage. There's still a lot which is not known about this relationship and it's, it's very interesting, I find. Okay, let's see. I know what comes next. What's that? Uh-oh. I actually remember this part. Barracudas are scary underwater. Because they can be big. And they are scary underwater. They're beautiful. Beautiful. But they are so... Ah, uh, bullies. That's not good, guys. Not good. I wonder where my class has gone. How awesome would it be to have such a class? Very awesome. Stromalytic cyanobacteria, gather! An entire ecosystem contained in one infinitesimal speck. Stromatolites are actually rocks composed of layers and layers and layers of cyanobacteria. Um, cyanobacteria are bacteria that do photosynthesis. I actually talked about this in a recent video I posted. They are very important organisms for the production of oxygen, consumption, consumption of carbon dioxide, and just overall for the food webs in the ocean. I do know that there are cyanobacteria that form colonies and they aggregate. I am not sure if they are 
shining like this, but would be cool. Would be definitely be cool. Are you, are you okay? There she is. Dory is a blue tang. After the movie came out, there was a run for blue tangs. People were buying blue tangs like crazy. And this actually created a bit of a problem for the population of these fish. I mean, I, there's no point to this. I just really wanted to mention this to you guys. And uh, someone out there uh, is thinking of buying a blue tang or a fish or something just because they think it's beautiful and cool and you see it on, a, in a, on TV. Please first make sure what kind of animal you're purchasing. Research about what you are buying. Don't just buy blindly. Even if you don't mean it, you might be helping a system that is harming the ecosystems and these animals, and which is probably what you don't want. Just, just keep that in mind. Cannot imagine anyone else but Ellen DeGeneres to give the voice of to Dory. It's just fits so perfectly. Blue tangs do not have anything specific about their memory different from other fish. It was really just a Dory thing, but it's hilarious. I love it. <laughs> Marlin is so mean, actually, in the beginning. <gasps> I forgot about these guys and not the vegetarian shark. Bruce is a white shark, I think. It's supposed to be a white shark. So one of them, that's obviously a hammer shark. The other one, I don't know, some kind of reef shark, blue shark. I will put the name of all these fish down below. I don't know them by heart. I mean, I know that the that the big guy is a puffer fish and I know that the purple and yellow guy is a cleaner fish. So they actually clean other fish. And I remember very well that here he's kind of afraid of germs, right? I think it's him. They kind I think they kind of try to play with that a bit. So they are cleaner fish, so they like everything clean. I think it's funny. I think it's funny how they pick things from the real fish and kind of try to put them in the characters in the movie. I think they did this very well. Yep. Shrimps are really good cleaners. It's true. They clean the aquariums very well. Oh. Pufferfish do inflate like that when they feel threatened. And they do that by bringing water, by kind of not inspiring, but they bring water into their body. They do, they do not have like a, t a thorax like we do, so their body can actually expand. But they avoid doing this unless really, really necessary and unless they feel really, really threatened. Because what happens is when they bring water into their bodies, their, their organs are kind of to uh, tossed to the side uh, to the side of their body and this creates a huge amount of stress and imagine what, what how that would feel and sometimes they might even die within the process if this doesn't work well or if something happens that is not supposed to happen but even if they do survive there's two things that kind of decrease their probability of survival the first one, just the fact that they are under a lot of stress, like not only psychologically because they are, because if they do that, it's because they feel threatened, but also physically because, well, their organs are just being thrown to, to the sides of their bodies and are kind of squashed, but also because they become much slower swimmers. So if they are doing this, usually they are being chased by some kind of predators and well, if they are slower, even though they are inflated, if the predator is really annoying, he might still try to catch the, the puffer fish. And if he's slower, he might be caught. And I have seen really videos that make, make me almost cry in anger of divers, people, normally diving instructors, forcing puffer fish to inflate to show and make a show to their students. Don't, just don't do that. You have no idea how you might be affecting this animal and the whole ecosystem. 
When you are diving, rule number one, don't touch anything unless really, really necessary. I'm all right. You see how intensely I feel about this. So yeah. Darla. Marlon and Dory have reached a place that is completely dark, which means that light does not penetrate so deep anymore. Usually in the ocean, in the open ocean where they are, where it's pretty transparent, light can reach until more or less 100 meters deep. I would doubt that in real life these fish would be able to go so deep. They would probably not be able to handle the pressure and plus also not be able to handle the different uh, temperature differences. They usually live in very shallow waters with a lot of light. I'm pretty sure they would not survive very long. So, hmm, this uh, movie is not 100% scientifically correct. <laughs> not sure how I feel about that. I'm kidding, obviously. I mean, I love it. Oh, I forgot, this is not working. <laughs> Here we go. Oh. <laughs> Oh my god, here I go. This is annoying. Okay. Actually, these fish do exist in the deep and they do have this like little lumination thing on the tip of their head and they do use it to attract prey because they're in the darkness. Anything that shines is going to be attracting stuff and they use it to attract their prey and that's how they kind of eat. Um, this lumination thing, the, the light that comes out of this thing is actually created by bacteria and if you don't know it, I study bacteria in the ocean, so they are cool. They are everywhere. <laughs> the ring of fire. <laughs> it's not a ring and it's not fire, but okay, I'll take it. <laughs> Dude, we're gonna get him out of here. We're gonna help him escape. Escape? Really? We're all gonna escape. Gil, please, not another one of your escape plans. Sorry, but they... So, something interesting about Gil. Gil is a Moorish idol, with, and I actually had to do a bit of a research on him because I didn't know much about this species of fish. And I found out that they are actually fish that are very difficult to keep in an aquaria. They are either very aggressive, they either destroy everything and eat everything, or they just don't eat and perish. So they are very, very difficult fish to keep in aquaria. Um, and maybe they knew that when doing this movie and that's why they made the fish that wants to escape the Moorish idol. So I think it's really funny that if this is a coincidence, it's a very funny coincidence. If it's not, then bravo to the producers and to whoever came with the idea of putting him as skill. I think one of the things that I'm realizing for the first time in Finding Nemo is that they actually put a lot of of, of the characteristics of the fish in real life into the fish in the movie. And I find that really interesting. It really shows that they did a lot of research on these species and that makes me like the movie even more. So I think this is gonna be it for now. I was planning on watching the whole movie at once, but I realized I have so much to say that I don't think I can do it in a short video. So I think I'm gonna cut this in two parts and I think this is a, good place to stop. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm sorry I cannot show you the full length of the movie. If you are interested, I highly recommend you, you, you check it out and go watch it and just be reminded of how awesome the ocean is. Then we can finish the movie together and uh, I have still for sure a lot to say. If you have any further questions or if you have any comments, leave it down in the comment section below. If you want to see more ocean or science related content, don't forget to subscribe. And if you like the video, don't forget to like it. There will be a part two coming out soon as well. And I hope you enjoyed that one too as well. So thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you with the next one. Bye.